Good morning. Uh, Blaine, before you leave, does, does an electric triangle really exist? I have it at home. That's awesome. <laughs> that is awesome. We need more triangle on this stage. And the cabs are amazing. Donovan Mitchell, real deal. Uh, can the Browns learn from the Cavs and the Indians? That's what I want to know. You get people with high character and high skill. You, do never, you never sacrifice on high character. Can we figure that out? All right. This is not a sermon on Cleveland sports, although I could feel like I could preach one. Um, all right, here we go. Uh, so we are in the sermon series, Character Studies of the Grounded and Ready, because we want you to be so grounded in the gospel that when you go outside of these walls, you are making impact through Jesus. So that, as we sang in this song, oh man, so that the lost will come home, the bound will go free, the weak will be strong, the broken redeemed, the sick will be well, the hungry will feast, the mourning will dance, the blinded will see. That's what we're after. And as I was thinking about this, the future is bright, there's nothing to fear. Revival is now, kingdom is here. Guess where revival has to start? In the church. If we want revival outside of these walls, it has to start here. And what we're going to talk about are some key elements if we are going to be who God has called us to be. Um, the focus, the, the title of this sermon could really be what is so amazing about grace? Because we're going to hone in on grace here this morning. And if we're going to be, if revival is going to happen out there in here, we have to understand grace so that we can be bearers of God's grace to the people outside of these walls. So we're going to look at Exodus 19 verses 1 through 6. Um, this is uh, Moses and the Israelites. They just had been rescued from hundreds of years of slavery in Egypt, right? They'd just been brought out about a month prior. Uh, so here God is going to talk to Moses and tell him uh, his next steps as he leads the Israelites. Exodus 19, verse 1. In the third month, after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on the same day they came to the wilderness of Sinai. For they had departed from Rephidim, had come to the wilderness of Sinai, and camped in the wilderness. So Israel camped there before the mountain, and Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. All right, so here, I'm going I'm to teach you six different things about grace. The first I want you to hear this morning is the uniqueness. I want you to hear about the uniqueness of grace. So Philip Yancey in his book, which I haven't read, but it's, it's been on my list for years, What's So Amazing uh, About Grace, he mentioned this scene in C.S. Lewis's life that I think is so, so good and talks to us about the uniqueness of God's grace. Here it goes. During a British conference on comparative religions, experts from around the world debated what, if any, belief was unique to the Christian faith. They began eliminating possibilities, incarnation, other religions had different versions of gods appearing in human form, resurrection, again, other religions had accounts of return from death. The debate went on for some time until C.S. Lewis wandered into the room. What's the rumpus about, he asked, and heard in reply that his colleagues were discussing Christianity's unique contribution among world religions. Lewis responded, oh, that's easy. It's grace. After some discussion, the conferees had to agree. The notion of God's love coming to us free of charge, no strings attached, seems to go against every instinct of humanity. 
the Buddhist Eightfold Path, the Hindu Doctrine of Karma, the Jewish Covenant, and the Muslim Code of Law. Each of these offers a way to earn approval. Only Christianity dares to make God's love unconditional. And so, Lewis was right. Grace is at the theological center of Christianity. It's what separates it from any other worldview that you will encounter in the world. All other religions teach that you have to strive and strain. And if you do it well enough, if you check all the right boxes, then, the God, then God or the gods just might accept you. Christianity teaches, on the other hand, that God, through his son, did everything necessary. He strived and strained in, strained in your place to check all the right boxes so that you could be made right with God. It's all based on his work in your place. That's the difference. Grace is at the theological center of Christianity, and this changes everything. Um, so God, I just want you to see, he starts with grace with the Israelites. When he's talking to Moses and he's telling Moses, here's what I want you to go tell the Israelites, God tells Moses to start with grace. Because the only way that Israel was going to be a nation that was a light to the other nations, a blessing to the other nations, is if they were rooted and grounded in grace. The same holds true for us. If we're going to be a light to the nations, we have to be grounded in grace. So, look at verse 4. What does God tell Moses to tell the Israelites? Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the children of Israel, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. This verse is soaked with grace, is it not? Did the Israelites battle the Egyptians? No, God battled them. God performed miracle after miracle which led to the release of the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. And the final plague that God put on the Egyptians is what ultimately released Pharaoh's grip on the Israelites. You remember, if you know the story, God, he sent the final, the tenth and final plague, and it was the killing of all the firstborn in Egypt, right? And that would include the Jewish people as well, because they were guilty of sin too. God was calling in their sin. He was judging the sin of all people in Egypt. But for the Israelite people, what did God give to them to take shelter under? The blood of a lamb. So they slaughtered a lamb, put the blood on their doorposts, and that protected the Israelite families from their firstborn sons being killed. And the angel of death passed over the Israelite families. God provided a substitute as an act of grace so that the Israelites would be freed, so that they would be spared. The Israelites' rescue was a tremendous act of grace on God's part. Did the Israelites deserve to be passed over by the angel of death? No. They were sinful. In so many ways, they had rebelled against God. And yet, God, the verse tells us, bore them on eagles' wings. Think about that. Think about an eagle and what uh, a mother eagle does to its young. Right? As they're learning to fly and often, you know, faltering and, and fluttering, the, the eagle gets underneath the young and allows the, the young to rest on her wings. This is what God did as Israel was faltering and fluttering in Egypt. You see, if you are going to reach your full potential, and if you are going to live differently than mainstream society, God's grace must be at the very center of your being. It's got to be core to who you are. Grace has to drive you. It has to be the fuel. Grace has to be the fuel that your life uh, drives on. Right? So, the uniqueness of grace, no other worldview will tell you that God is a gracious God who came in the person of Jesus to do everything necessary so that you could be reconciled to him. Every other religion will tell you, you've got to earn that. You've got to be good enough. All right, let's look at, then, the rescue of grace. What does is, what is God's grace rescue us from? Like the Israelites, apart from God, 
We are slaves to sin. The Bible makes it clear we are slaves. We're addicted to sin. We can't stop sinning. Just when we think we got a handle on one sin, another one pops up, and we're constantly spinning the plates of our sin. We're addicted to it. Our needs, our desires, our wants, our happiness, our glory, our hurts. Apart from God, and when we're addicted to sin, we cannot stop thinking about ourselves. Apart from God, we can not stop worshiping God's substitutes. We make uh, a God out of our career. We make a God out of sex. We make a God out of sports. We make a God out of achievement, a God out of entertainment, a God out of drugs and alcohol. We are trying to fill the God-shaped hole in our heart that only God can fill. But this is what addiction to sin does. You're constantly looking for God's substitutes that cannot provide you the fulfillment that you were created to have. Apart from God, we, we, stop, uh, we can't stop lying, we can't stop gossiping, we can't stop cheating, we can't stop stealing. Apart from God, we can't stop our anger, we can't stop our jealousy, we can't stop our envy, our anxiety, our worry, our fear, our lust, our greed. We are addicts and we are self-destructing apart from God. Apart from God, we experience dis- disintegration. We are in the exodus being slaves to a greater tyrant, Satan, sin, and death. And the scariest thing to think about is the person that we will become apart from God a thousand years from now. If we in our addicted sin, you know, addicted to sin state are allowed to live for another thousands, you know, another thousand years, can you imagine the monsters we will become? The th- this thought brought me back again to uh, C.S. Lewis once again, who's, who wrote this in Mere Christianity. And please listen to this. Zone in. This is so, it's so important. Christianity asserts that we are going to go on forever. You know you're going to live forever. You will li- everybody here is going to live forever. And this, this life here is like that. We will li- you are an eternal person. All right, so Christianity asserts that we are going to go on forever. Now... There are a great many things that wouldn't be worth bothering about if I was only going to live 80 years or so. But I had better bother about if I'm going to go on living forever. Check this out. Perhaps my bad temper or my jealousy are getting worse so gradually that the increase in my lifetime will not be very noticeable, but it might be absolute hell in a million years. In fact, if Christianity is true, Hell is precisely the correct technical term for it. Hell begins with a grumbling mood, always complaining, always blaming others. But you are still distinct from it. You may even criticize it in yourself and wish you could stop it. But there may come a day when you can no longer. Then there will be no you left to criticize the mood or even to enjoy it, but just the grumble itself going on and on forever like a machine. It is not a question of God sending us to hell. In each of us, there is something growing which will be hell unless it is nipped in the bud. You see, to be ravished by God's grace, we must clearly see our slavery to Satan, sin, and death. If we do not see the slavery, we will not fully appreciate the deliverance and the victory. We must see it accurately. Apart from God, we are addicted to sin. Apart from God, we are undeserving of God's goodness. Apart from God, we are unable to free ourselves. And we are absolutely destined to become brute beasts, monsters, that will, if we keep going on that trajectory, will make Hitler and, and Putin seem like Mother Teresa. Amen. The rescue of grace. The uniqueness of grace. Let's go to the miracle of grace. Think about the miracles that God performed to rescue the Israelites out of slavery. Miracle after miracle, right? Well, God has done the same thing for us to rescue us from our slavery to the Egypt of sin and death. Think about it. The incarnation. 
God, the most powerful being in the universe, makes himself so weak, so small, that he can't even change his own diaper. It's remarkable. And then this, this God who took on human flesh, he grows and he becomes an adult who lives perfectly in every way. Not once did Jesus sin. Not once did Jesus look at a woman lustfully. Not once did Jesus tell a white lie. He was absolutely morally perfect, spotless in every way. And then, when he should receive just celebration for a perfect life, we find Jesus at the end of life dying on a cross, being treated like the most wretched criminal brutally being beaten and hung to die. And what we see him doing is him taking on the judgment we deserved. He becomes our Passover lamb for us, our substitute, so that we could receive grace. And then after his death, another miracle, we see him rising from the dead, conquering death. Conquering the worst evil could throw at him. Miracle after miracle after miracle that has led to our emancipation. Oh, the miracle of our incarnation, Jesus' perfect life, his perfect death, his resurrection. Don't you see that although grace is free to you, it was not free for God? It cost him the, the death of his son? It couldn't have been any more costly for God? For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. All right, to understand grace, to be ravished by it, to be enamored by grace, we have to be able to see the uniqueness of it, the rescue it provides, the miracle of it, and we have to fourthly be able to see the benefits of grace. What was the benefit of the Israelites' uh, rescue? God called them his special treasure. The Hebrew behind this phrase is referring to what a king would have his own storehouse of his most precious gold. He would have it in his own safekeeping. God, we are his special treasure. We are God's own special reserve of gold. That's how he views us. God, as God's special treasure, we have immense value to him. We are so valuable in his sight that, again, he was willing to sacrifice his son to have us. We are the object of his love. He cherishes us. We are the apple of his eye. And as God's special treasure, guess what we get to experience? These are the, this is the benefits of grace. We get forgiveness, acceptance, adoption into the family of God. The gift of the Holy Spirit that transforms us from a beast to a beauty. In fact, to quote C.S. Lewis one more time, in, in, in something he called, uh, that he wrote, that he called Weight of Glory, he talks about if you could see what the Christian will become when Jesus returns, if you could see it now, how beautiful, how glorious the people all around you are, how glorious they'll be made when Jesus returns, you would be tempted to worship them right now. Philippians 3.21 tells us that when Christ appears, he will transform our lowly bodies so that we will be like his glorious body. Matthew 13.43 tells us, Jesus told his followers, you will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. 21 tells us when Jesus returns, even creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and will be brought into the freedom of the being ruled by the children of God. Look at this. As God's special treasure, we are put on the path of present transformation that is leading to ever-increasing glory of living with the resurrected Jesus in a resurrected body on the resurrected earth in which we will see Jesus' face and death and suffering and sin will be no more. Don't you see that the Father allowed His Son and the Son, they were all in agreement, so was the Holy Spirit. They 
allowed, Jesus allowed himself to be treated like a beast so you could be treated like a beauty. Amen. It's remarkable. All right, fifth thing. Grace. <laughs> so if we're going to be ravished by it, we need to be ravished by God's grace. Because it now, these last two points, this is what grace produces in us. It supplies grace when we really grab a hold of it, when it becomes real to our heart. Then we have now a new motivation to live. God started talking to Israel about his grace because he wanted them to have the motivation they needed to actually live for him and obey him. Look, the ancient Egyptians, they, the context the Israelites were in, they worshipped tons of gods, thousands of gods. And they, those gods worked on the, the premise that if you do the right rituals, you do the right rites in just the right way, then God, you might appease him and he might do good by you. But if he's having a bad day, you could do all the right things and he might spite you anyways. That was how the Egyptian religious worldview operated. And God, he starts with grace. And here's why he starts with grace to the Israelites. This is what I would, he's basically saying to them in my words, obey me not to earn my favor, acceptance, love, and forgiveness. If you are trying to be religious and trying to obey God to earn his favor, acceptance, and love, it means you haven't understood grace. Grace has not become real to your heart. I see a lot of people in the church living this way. This is not the gospel. Put your deadly doing down. Obey me not to earn my favor, acceptance, and love and forgiveness. Obey me because I have already freely given these things to you, they're already yours. May your obedience be a response to my amazing grace. Not an attempt to try and earn my favor. <laughs> you see, I don't want you just to obey me because you feel like you must or else. I want you to obey me because you want to as a response to my love for you. Just as I treasure you, I want you to treasure me in return. I am not interested in a cold, distant and transactional relationship in which you attempt to use and manipulate me to get what you want from me. I want to have a relationship with you of mutual affection, love, and intimacy. This is what I've created you for. This is what will bring the greatest pleasure to my heart and your heart. Have you ever heard somebody use the expression, I would run through a wall for them? I'm sure you have. Why do we use that expression in regards to a person? I've heard uh, leaders, when I'm working with leaders, and I ask them who has influenced your life the most beyond your parents, often these leaders, they'll mention somebody, and then I've heard the comment, I would run through a wall for them. Why do we use that expression? The reason we use that expression is because that person has loved us so well. Typically, when we were in a really dark moment, they were there with us in it, and they helped us <laughs> overcome it. And it's like we cannot thank them enough. We, there's, we feel like there's no way we could possibly repay them. There's no request that they could ask of us that would be too much to ask. And so it's like, I love that person. I'd run through a wall for them. I would take a bullet for them. You see, this is how God wants us to feel about him. Sarah mentioned that God, he's going to, on Mount Sinai, he's going to give them the law, the Ten Commandments, right? If you do not start with grace, those Ten Commandments are just going to seem like this duty. But it should not be. Because this is what God wants. Have no other gods before me. If we're like rooted in grace, and that's real to our heart, our response is going to be, of course not. I'm not going to have any more. I'm not going to have a God before you, God my Redeemer, God, I'm not going to have another God before you. I am not going to elevate my marriage or my career or my children to, you know, the level of placing them on the throne of my heart. I'm not going to do it. You showed so much grace to me. Do not take my name in vain. Of course not. I would not want to dishonor the one who honored me by rescuing me. 
Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. This shouldn't even be hard. This goes to tell you how addicted we are to sin, guys. This command right here. We are so addicted to sin that we can't even take a vacation day a week. God wants us to have a day off where we just pray and play and eat good food and be with friends and family, but we are so addicted to activity and busyness and productivity, we can't do it. God is such a gracious God, he wants us to have a vacation day a week. But surely we should be like, yeah, you want me to take a vacation day? Absolutely, the grace you showed me, for sure. Honor your father and mother, but they're knuckleheads. Do you know the pain they've caused me? But here's the thing, you honored me when I was causing you pain. And so you know what? Even if I could not find anything in their life in terms of, you know, a way to like show, like to respect them for, I can at least honor them just because of the position. Do not kill. Of course not. I would never want to kill a person made in your image that you died for. Do not commit adultery. Yes, of course. Forgive. Mm. But how many times, God? 70 times 7. All right. Love your enemies. Okay. God, you've gone too far. Wait a second. God, you forgave me when I was your enemy. I can forgive those who have hurt me far less than I've hurt you. I can love my enemies because when I was your enemy, you loved me. You see, when God has showed us such enormous, extravagant, amazing grace, there's no request on his part to us that is too big to ask. But it has to start with grace. And here's the thing, and this is the final thing that I'll, sh I'll share to you. The role grace enables us to play. Uh, before I mention this, let me just say this. Are you constantly feeling like you're not good enough? Are you constantly feeling like you have, to, you have to read your Bible, you have to serve at the church, you have to, have to, have to, have to? Is that how you're feeling? Are you constantly feeling guilty? If so, grace needs to become more real to your heart. Look, you don't have to do anything that the Bible says to be in a right, to be reconciled to God, to be in a relationship with Him. The minute we say you have to do stuff, and now you are saved by your works. Think about that. You don't have to evangelize. You don't have to read your Bible. You don't have to go to church to be in a right relationship with God, to experience salvation. The minute anybody tells you you have to do any of those things, now it's no longer grace. They're saying you have to earn it. Now, if you read in Romans, what was the argument in Romans? If we preach that, then everybody's just going to keep sinning. So we can't do that. We can't tell people that. But it's not right. Because look, if I realize I don't have to evangelize and God's going to love me, and he sacrificed for me, and there is grace, and nothing can change my standing with him, ah, I have a motivation to go share my love for Jesus. It's, it's, it, it's, you see, when we understand grace, it goes from I have to to I get to. It goes from I have to follow God to I get to follow God. Unless this change is made in our heart, we're not going to be able to play the role that God has called us to play. Let me just say this quick. God calls us to be a kingdom of, of priests and a holy nation. What does this mean? When you think of priest, do you think of like an old, white, 65-year-old with glasses and a white collar and who never smiles and just seems, you know, perpetually just grumpy? 
If so, that's not what God meant when he told the Israelites, you are my kingdom of priests. When you think holy, do you think of like a self-righteous, goody two-shoes who just is, looks down their nose at other people and... Mm, that's what I do when I think of that word holy. Maybe you do too, but this is not what God meant. Holy means distinct, different, unique, set apart. You see, the way we are going to be distinct out there is by obeying God's commands. And the only way we are going to obey God's commands is if grace is motivating us. That's the only way. And the Holy Spirit is giving us more grace to actually be obedient. So this is the chain. God's grace towards us, give us gives us the motivation to show our love back to him by obeying his commands. And obeying his commands makes us distinct from the world. That's what it means to be a holy nation. Distinct, different, unique, set apart. All right, priest. To be a kingdom of priests. Priests had three roles in the Old Testament. They represented God to people. They represented people to God, and they performed animal sacrifices so that the offender could be forgiven and reconciled to God. Now, here's what's important. You cannot be distinct and unique in a corner somewhere. That's not going to work. You've got to be in the world being distinct and unique, which means that's the priest part. How do you be a priest today? Three ways. As God's priest, he has called us to represent God to people. Is your life a walking advertisement for this God that you love? Can people look at you and see something different? Do they see that you, you possess a real humility because the gospel has humbled you? And so you don't think about yourself all the time. Do they see a humility in you that seeks to understand before being understood? Do they see a peaceful confidence in you because you are God's special treasure? Do they see in you a deep love even for difficult people? Are we, as his priests, representing him to people? He's called us to do that. Second thing is, as God's priests, we are called to represent people to God. How do we do that? How do you represent a person to God? You do it through prayer. You pray for them. You pray for their salvation. You pray for their healing. You pray for their marriage. You pray for their broken relationships. You pray for peace and contentment in their life. We pray for people. How else are we God's kingdom of priests in the world today? Well, as God's priests, instead of performing sacrifices to atone for people's sin, we point them to the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, whose sacrifice takes away all sin and permanently reconciles a person to God. Which means we tell people about God's love for them and their need for Jesus as Savior and Lord. We tell them. We call them to repent and believe in the resurrected Jesus. And we do so in a winsome way. With a tone that does not say, I'm right, you're wrong, and you're stupid if you don't agree with me. <clears throat> you see, if you just act as a priest without the distinct character of Jesus, the holiness of Jesus, which is marked by humility, confidence, and security, no one will listen to you. If you have the character of Christ, but don't engage in your priestly duties, no one will be impacted through you. We are called to be both a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And if you're thinking, well, maybe this is Old Testament stuff, like we still, you know, I mean, today we don't have to be a kingdom of priests and a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Well, right here in the book of 1 Peter chapter 2, which is in the New Testament, verses 9 and 10, Peter tells his audience, but you are a chosen generation of royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, do you think Peter is borrowing something from somebody? That you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but now are the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. And then Revelation 1, 5, and 6 uses this language of priest uh, again. 
To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So there you have it. The uniqueness of grace, the rescue of grace, the miracle of grace, the benefits of grace, the motivation that grace supplies, and the role grace enables us to play. Let's pray. Father, help us to understand your grace towards us. May we be ravished by it. May, we be, may our hearts be enamored by it. May it give us your grace. Give us the motivation we need to be for you, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, so that we are a blessing to our city, a city that is in desperate need of you. It's in Jesus' name, the ultimate priest, the ultimate holy one that we pray. Amen.